Good morning, Victory. Hey, we want to welcome all of our online viewers and Hamilton Mill Live and Midtown Live. Let's welcome everybody as they join us all around the city of Atlanta and around the world. You know, we have viewers all over the world that are participating in this one series. Some people are from Africa, from China, from South and Central America. So this is just not just here at this particular location, but it's all over the world. This is a very important series that we're about to start. We're calling this series one. We're talking about racial reconciliation or reconciling culture. And I don't think it takes any genius to figure out that the world needs a little reconciliation right now. And especially in America right now, we are facing a lot of tension between cultures, between races, with all the issues about immigration, Black Lives Matter, all the things that have played out over the last couple of years. And the tension just continues to build. And there doesn't seem to be answers coming from anywhere. And so we believe that God has answers. He has a way to dialogue about this subject to bring healing and for the next four weeks, we're going to talk about it. We're going to talk about it here in the campuses, but we're also going to talk about it in small groups. And if you're not a part of a church here in Atlanta, you can go online. You can watch some of these sermons. You can pick up some of the dialogue that we're going to talk about. And hopefully, by the finish of this series, this is our goal, is that you will understand the principle of what it takes to become one. Amen? All right, so take your Bibles out. Turn to Genesis chapter 11. While you're turning there, let me give you a little background for all of our online viewers and those who are new to Victory. I want to give you a little background about our church to understand where we're coming from. We're a 27-year-old church started in 1990 with six people in Atlanta, Georgia, kind of a hotbed of racial tension and has been that most of, most of my life. I grew up in the Martin Luther King era. In the eighth grade, I was uh, bused, forcefully bused across town to a school where I walked into my homeroom class and I was the only white student in that class. During that year, there was all kinds of racial tension. It was following the assassination of Martin Luther King and there was all kinds of problems in, in the school systems of the South. And they started a, a riot at our school. They burned cars. There was just a lot of, uh, as a national event. They pulled, my parents pulled me out, put me into an all white Christian school uh, to kind of protect me, and that's kind of how I grew up. I went to college at a predominantly white college and then lived in a predominantly white world until I got saved. And when I got saved, I started sensing that God was saying some things to me about bridging the gap or beginning to interact more with people of other cultures. Now, over this journey of 27 years of pastoring, this church now has 139 different nationalities in it, which would make it, if not the most, one of the most multicultural churches in America. And I think over the 27 years, we've learned a few things about you folks, that you all have different ways of thinking about culture, about race, and, and we've tried to learn to navigate. Every time something racially happens out in society, we have to navigate that in this church in a different way because we're not just coming from one race viewpoint, we're coming from multicultural race viewpoints. And so I want you to give me a little grace in this message because I'll probably say things that will make you kind of cringe a little bit, maybe think, I can't believe he just said that. But that's the way you have to talk about these issues sometimes in order to get the point across for healing, amen? So let's take this journey together. In Genesis chapter 11, this is the beginning of where it all started in Genesis 11. After humanity was created, lived on the earth for a while, the Bible describes a time where they were all one together. And I wanna read just a few verses to kind of give you some context here. In verse one, it says, now the whole earth had one language and one speech. Notice, I want you to notice how many times the word one is used. One language and one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and he dwelt there, and they said to one another, Come, let us bake, make bricks and bake them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, and they had asked for, for, for mortar. And they said, now listen to this carefully, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. So what they were doing is they were so together that they believed that they could do anything. When you're one together, how many of you know that you can just do anything? And they started to build this tower. It's interesting that, that the Bible uses the word tower. We, we, we have a lot of emphasis on towers 
If you notice the, you know, the one world tower that we just rebuilt in New York City that was torn down, that was by the terrorists back in 9-11. And, and, and there's a lot of emphasis on building high places. Whenever you go to a big city, there's always a big emphasis on building high towers. If you'll notice, anywhere you go in the world, major cities, they always have these tall buildings. And the tall buildings are meant to represent power and authority. In fact, if you go to places like Israel, you'll find in some of the major places of Israel, at the very top of the pinnacle of the city, there's usually a mosque. Because the Muslims believe that wherever they are entering in a city, they, want, they must build their mosque at the top of that city to indicate the authority over that city. And that's the way it is. And so usually whatever tall buildings are in countries, they represent a lot of times the God that they worship. In our nation, our towers represent finances. And that is the God that many people in America worship. Here, they're building a tower because they want to be like God. They want to be equal to God. They want to be on the same place as God. It's the birthing of humanism. And it says they, they, they started to build this thing. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, indeed, the people are, what's that word? One. And they all have one language. And this is what they begin to do. And then he said something interesting. Now, nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. In other words, because they're so together, they're so one together, nothing can be withheld from them. Come, let us go down, and there confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they ceased building the city. Therefore, its name is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth." All right, so at that point, culture began to divide. Culture began to divide across the earth. Nations began to form. And all of a sudden, all these people groups began to divide according to their language and according to their human culture. You fast forward over the next few thousand years and you'll see all kinds of wars, all kinds of division that continues to build. Slavery would be instituted between different people groups. Whenever one group would take over another group, they'd make them their slaves. Slavery is not a new thing in America. It's not a new thing. It's been around for thousands of years. And all of a sudden, now you have a whole world that is divided, trying to conquer each other. And here comes Jesus. Jesus comes on the scene, and he begins to teach the people what's happening in the world. And he says, as time progresses on, he says, here's a sign that the end is near. He said, nation will rise against nation. In other words, people against people, kingdom against pe kingdom. The strategy of the enemy is to conquer through division. The devil knows that if he can divide people in a nation or people groups, then he can conquer them. And certainly we see that happening in America today. We are a nation divided. We're called the United States of America, but we should be called the divided states of America because we're not united. We are not a united people. And we've been putting our trust and our hope in government and presidents and things of that nature, and we find the more we put trust in there, the more divided we become. We become divided politically, we become divided racially, culturally, and even in the church, as Martin Luther King said back in the 60s, that the 11 o'clock hour on Sunday morning is the most segregated hour in America. So we haven't even given the answer in the church. Most churches are one race only. 85% of churches in America are one race only, predominantly only churches. And so it sends a message to the world and the way we view multiculturalism or racism, a lot has to do with the era that we were born. If we were older, we have a different viewpoint than we do if we're younger. But we all know that God wants us to come together. He wants us to be one. So he sends Jesus on the scene. And he sends Jesus to do something for us to bridge the gap. Now, if you'll notice, when he comes on the scene, he starts to cross over into other cultures. And then he says to the, to, the, to the people that are going to gather that start the church, he says, I want you to go to Jerusalem. And he says, I want you to wait for the promise of the Father. And he says, and then I'm gonna send the Holy Spirit upon you, and he's gonna make you a witness of me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. Well, they got all of that except the word Samaria, because Samaritans were the arch enemies of the Jews. They had history, many, many, many years going back, a lot of history like we have in this country between blacks and whites. 
And it was like saying to one race, you're going to now cross over to the other race and you're going to love them through the, through the dysfunction of your past and you're going to bring them together as one. The Holy Spirit comes on the church, says all the nations of the world were gathered in Jerusalem. They were all Jewish, but they were from all the nations of the world. The Holy Spirit comes down. They hear their languages being spoken supernaturally by tongues. And as they hear their languages being spoken, they hear the wonderful works of God described in their own human culture. And they ask Peter, what is that that's happening? And Peter, this is that what was spoken by the prophet Joel in the last days. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And out of that came this new birthing of what we call the church or the New Testament church. And the first church in the world was a multicultural, multinational church that didn't speak the same languages, didn't have the same culture. They only had one thing in common. They had Jesus. And when Jesus became the center of their life, it started breaking down the walls. Paul would describe this in Ephesians chapter 2. I'm going to read a few verses that he spoke about concerning Jesus. He said in verse 14, for he himself is our peace who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. And his purpose was to create in himself, look at this, one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace and in one body to reconcile both to them to God through the cross. In other words, he's saying part of the purpose of the cross was not just to reconcile people to God, but to reconcile them together, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away from other nations, and peace to those who were near from Jerusalem. For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. He's specifically talking about the merging of the Jew and the Gentile. The Jew and the Gentile were not the same culture, they did not get along together. The Gentile world, predominantly ruled by the Roman world at that time, was in charge. The Jewish world was under, subjugated to the Roman world. And there was great tension between those two groups of people and specifically between their religions. The Gentile world were heathen. They had no relationship with the true God. They worshiped idols. They had all kinds of gods. They, they had all kinds of different kinds of gods that they worshiped. Greek gods, Roman gods. And then the Jewish people had the God, but they did not have the understanding of salvation through Jesus Christ who had redeemed them. And what Jesus was coming to do was break down all those walls and show them how to be overcome all these dysfunctions of their past by being born again. And once they got born again, he said, now you can function together as one new humanity. But there's a challenge with bridging that gap. And that same challenge is still here today. Let me go through a few things that we're challenged with. First of all, many people don't, aren't aware of this, but we have this thing called spiritual warfare. Now, the Bible says it this way in Ephesians chapter six, in verse 12, it says, our fight is not against people on the earth. Let's say that together. Our fight is not against people on earth. Now, wouldn't it be lovely if you really believe that? You need to remember that in your marriage. Our fight is not against each other. See, a lot of times marriage falls apart because they don't understand spiritual warfare. They don't understand the devil hates them being married. And so he attacks them at their weakest point of personality and gets them to battle with each other, all the while being ruled over by spiritual warfare. Devils get in your marriage. Have you ever found that out? Devils get in relationships. I'm amazed at how many Christians and even people don't even believe in devils, yet the Bible's full of explanation about demons. And it says that our battle's not with people on the earth, but against the rulers and authorities and the powers of this world's darkness, the unseen world, against the spiritual powers of evil in the heavenly places. So we're not battling when we're talking about racism, we're not battling with people here, but the devil makes sure that we're always angry at people instead of at the real power that's behind it, the devil. Wherever you see racial tension, you see spiritual uh, motivation behind that. There's always spirits ruling over cities, over towns, over regions of the world, 
influencing the natural humanity around it. And as a Christian, you gotta recognize that the devil is in the air trying to influence you to fall in line with everybody else in the world. This is why you've got to be aware of spiritual authority and take authority over those spirits. All right, so that's the first challenge. The second challenge is conflicting perspectives. We all have different perspectives depending on the culture, the race that we grew up in. We view things through the lens of our race, and we don't sometimes think through that very clearly. For example, white people view racism as an individual problem, where black people view racism as an institutional problem. A broader problem that's in, that's in the whole institution of society where white people think it's only just individuals. I'm not racist, but maybe some people are. I would think most white people would say they're not racist, but when they live their life segregated from other races and, and, they, and, they, and they pull their children out of any school or any town or any church that has a little bit too many of the other kind of race, that's racism. That's racism. But institutionalized racism is where we believe it's in the whole institution of a community or a society that starts from the beginning. Where did it start? Black people were forcefully brought over to America. They didn't come on their own free will. They, they were forcefully brought over here as slaves and enslaved for many, many years. And even though they were eventually granted freedom, freedom was automatic for whites and then whites granted rights to blacks and other races, but they're still not received the total freedom that God had provided for them through their culture. There's a, there's a great uh, movie or documentary out today called The 13th. Have you ever seen The 13th? Uh, let me see how, how many hands have seen 13th. All the black people are raising their hands, see? <laughs> White people haven't watched this movie. Hispanic people haven't watched this movie. Asian folks haven't watched this movie, generally speaking. It's just black people that watch this movie. But it's, it's a great documentary. And it's a, it's, a, it's a study of racism in America, but it's specifically focusing down on the problem of incarceration of black Americans. And it's a study done over many years. And it's, it's on Netflix, so you can watch it on Netflix. You need to go home and watch it. I've watched it two times, and I'm gonna watch it a third time because I'm still trying to digest all the information through the lens of my white perspective. But basically, the, 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 the challenge in that particular documentary, just so you'll understand it, is when we look at the inordinate number of blacks that are incarcerated in America, cons cons considering all the incarceration of America, why are so many blacks incarcerated? Many people from a white perspective see this as, well, they're just criminals. And they're just acting in, in, in accordance with who they are. And the reality of it is, if you study the history of incarceration, if you go all the way back to 1865, when the 13th Amendment was instituted under Abraham Lincoln, it said that you were granted freedom, but there was a little caveat in that 13th Amendment that basically says, unless you're incarcerated. And if you're incarcerated, then you lose some of your rights in society such as the right to vote. And, and, they, and so what, what happened is, if you, if you go study slavery, you'll find in the South, slavery was the boon of economics. If you had slaves, you had a business running, those slaves made that business work. And as soon as the 13th Amendment was granted, it eradicated slavery, so all of a sudden there was an economic trouble in the South because we didn't have those thousands and thousands of slaves to do our work for us. They were now free. So the only way we could get them to do our work for us is we had to put them in jail. So as you're loitering, you go to jail. You looked at a white woman the wrong way, jail. And they started putting black people in jail and an inordinate number of black people were put in prison and then used back on the plantations. Prisoners replaced slaves for the plantation work. Are you following me? That has grown down through the years down through the years until now prisons become a big business. We've gone from 370,000 people in prison in 1970 to over 2.2 million in America. We are the largest incarcerating nation in the world. 
We incarcerate more people because there has to be a certain number that we have to keep in prison to keep the business running. And don't, you don't know this, but a lot of corporations use prisoners to do their work for them. And it's a business that is multi-million dollar business that's multifaceted and literally has taken the black American male out of his family, incarcerated him in the three strikes and you're out thing that happened during the Bill Clinton era, during the Bill Clinton era. All you Democrats. <laughs> has incarcerated people for life, for very sometimes small things. The basic Black Lives Movement, just so you understand this, the basic Black Lives Movement is from a black perspective is, hey, I'm not saying other people aren't important, other races aren't important, but there's, I have a sense or a feeling in America that I'm not as important. I'm not as important as other races, and I just want you to know I'm here, and I'm struggling, and I'd like you to kind of work with me to try to bring some, some equality to my life. See, I, I never saw this as a white person because I, I grew up with a white perspective. I, I just sat back in the Lazy Boy and watched the news and, and I formed my opinions based on the media instead of what was really happening until I got to know people in a different world. What about the Hispanic perspective? They're, you think I was gonna leave you out? <laughs> oh yeah, you got a perspective. Everything filters through the lens of immigration. Everything filters through that lens and how we're going to deal with immigration. And now we have new laws starting to form about immigration. There's a lot of fear in society. There's a lot of people that wake up every morning not sure if they're safe in this country anymore. Not sure if they're going to be deported anymore. You say, well, I, I, you know, I just don't believe, I believe that that would never happen in America. Really? Go back to 1942 when Pearl Harbor was attacked. In Pearl Harbor, when Pearl Harbor was attacked, we had about 120,000 Japanese Americans. And, I think there was 80, 60, 80 to 60,000 of them that were United States citizens, many of them born in America. About 110,000 of them lived in the West Coast, most of them in California. As soon as Pearl Harbor, before Pearl Harbor, everybody was just amenable to Japanese Americans. They're, they're great, we love Japanese. As soon as Pearl Harbor happened, wait a minute, those Japanese, they might, be, they might have another plan. They might have something that's going on inside them that wants to take our country down. And so they built these internment camps and they took forcefully 80,000 of these Japanese people and they started putting them in camps. You said they couldn't do that. Yes, 60,000 of them were United States citizens. And they were put in camps for up to four years. They were taken from their families, taken from their jobs, taken from their properties. They were extricated from California. You could no longer live in California. You could no longer live on the West Coast because there was, those were military bases, declared military bases. You say that never happened. Yes, it did. It happened in this nation. Now they've since apologized. Our nation has since apologized to the Japanese Americans. But that happened, and it's, it, the reason I say that is because there are so many Americans today that would like to do that with the Muslim community. They would like to just extricate them from the country. And, and think, well, well, I mean, you know, they're all, they all have evil intentions. Really? Now, certainly there are people in our country that have evil intentions, but there's some good old white country boys that have evil intentions too. <laughs> Some of them live in South Georgia. Some of them blow up buildings in Oklahoma. Y'all all right out there? I mean, there's, nobody's got a curb on terrorism. We, we have a lot of terroristic activity that's not just Muslim activated. Now, I know, I know a lot of people, are, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not supporting the Muslim religion. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that that's, that's okay religion. We want to get Muslims saved. We want to get people saved. Get them, give them into, and many Muslims are open to the gospel because they have many of the biblical principles, they just don't have Jesus. And if you're here and you're watching and you're Muslim, let me just tell you something, Jesus loves you. He loves you as much as he loves any Gentile Christian in the world. He loves everybody. All right. Everybody's got a perspective. The Asians have a perspective. I'm sure that 
that many Asians come into this country or their perspective is very culturally motivated because many Asians stay to themselves, stay within their cultures. They'll go into regions, build shopping centers, buy subdivisions, put up signs in their language, only speak in their language, create churches in their language, and they have a culture unto themselves. Come on now, you know it's true, Koreans. You know it's true. But Jesus loves you too. Now, the younger generations are not quite like that. It's a battle right now. There's a tension about preserving culture in the Asian culture because if you're born into a, a family in America and you're born in America, but your family was born in another country, there's this battle for your culture, to, to preserve your culture. And that's your perspective. So everything is through a different perspective and we have to understand that. Now, the third thing, the third challenge we have is cultural idolatry where we literally exalt our culture to the place where we worship it. And this happens in church today. Literally, whole churches are set up based on human culture. It has nothing to do with God. The music is all about your culture. And if you go into a church like this where it's not your culture style, you stand there with your hands in your pocket and you don't even worship God because you worship the style of the worship instead of God himself. Watch out that you don't worship worship, but you worship God. You ought to be able to worship God if somebody comes out here and sings a, a hymn or a rap or whatever they do. If it's, if it's going upwards, it does, it's, it's just because it's not your culture, you just enter into it. Otherwise, it becomes idolatry to you, and some people form their whole church life around the idolatry of their culture. Are you following me? And then there's the final thing. This is a big challenge in America, and I hate to say this because I represent this to some degree, the apathy of the minority, of the majority, I should say. The apathy of the majority, the white race. Now, I grew up, I'm a white person. I know it's hard to believe that, but I am a white person. <laughs> I've got a, about a quarter Cherokee Indian in me. I, I'll, I'll be honest with you. If you do that you know, test, that DNA test, you'll find out you got a little something in you too. You just didn't know it. Everybody's got a little something, something somewhere down the road. But my people, we've been herded out there in the Midwest into little you know, reservations and forgotten. But we were the original Native Americans. All right, Native Americans that were forcefully forced off our lands by some of you Europeans. <laughs> Unfortunately, I got some European in me too. I got some German in me, I got some French, I got some Canadian. I tell you, we all got some stuff inside of us. And there's that battle that constantly goes on between those cultures sometimes. And what happens is it's, it's easy for us as white folks, if you grew up in the white world, to just kind of sit back and judge everything through the lens of your culture because, and, and just become kind of apathetic about other races and the plight of other races. It's not until you get into their lives that you begin to discover there's some real serious stuff going on between people of different races that you're not even living with, you're not even aware of. All right, so these are the challenges that we have, and this is why we're doing this series, to kind of eradicate the apathy, break the cultural idolatry, go through all the different perspectives, and really help you understand spiritual warfare so that we can start to become one again, amen? All right, so let me give you some starting points today. This is, this is just a starting point. We're gonna go a little deeper next week into some, into some things about prejudice. Then we're gonna talk about, we're gonna, in the third week, it's gonna be a hot week, we're gonna talk about politi politics and race. That's right. <laughs> Trump versus Obama. That's what we're gonna do. No, I'm, not, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. That would be a hot topic right there. We'll get battle bots. <laughs> all right, so let me give you some talking points about how you start a reconciliation. First of all, you gotta approach everything with a heart of reconciliation. Now this is important for all you social media gurus because I think a lot of us forget that when we get on social media. When you look at social media, I think one of the challenges of social, me social media is it's, it's very divisive. And there's a, I know there's a lot of things on there that are meant to in, 
instruct you or educate you. But what happens is a lot of those things that we put on there to educate people also cause anger and division. And what, what we really need to understand is everything that Jesus came to do was from the heart of reconciliation. He didn't, came to, he didn't come to divide us, he came to reconcile us. Now there's a scripture in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter five that bears kind of studying, looking at a little deeper. And here's what it says. Paul writes about this whole idea of Jesus living inside of us. In verse 15 he says, and he, talking about Jesus, he died for all. He didn't die for white people and forget black people, or he didn't die for Hispanic people and forget Asian people. He didn't die for Christians and forget Muslims. He died for everyone. He died for the whole world. It's our job to help people understand that. That those who live should live no longer for what? Themselves or my people. Did you hear what I just said? But for him who died for them and rose again, therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we've known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a, what? New creation. Old things, that includes old wounds, old prejudices, old wineskin thinking, have passed away. Behold, all things now start over again. They're new. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. And he has given us the ministry of reconciliation. In other words, you've been, the first ministry you are given when you receive Christ is the ministry of reconciliation. Every believer gets the ministry of reconciliation. You, have, you say, well, I don't know what I'm called to do. The first thing you're called to do is reconcile people. Reconcile people to God through Jesus Christ, that's your first thing, and then reconcile people to each other. Your heart should be shaping around reconciliation, not making your point. Did you hear what I just said? Not making your point, even though sometimes we wanna make our point. We feel it's our just duty to make our point. Because if we don't make our point, then our point has not been made. Can I just tell you something? Every point you need to make is being made by people who are not reconciling. Is it working? Is it causing unification or more division? Are you trying to get people to hear you or are you just trying to say it like it is? Are you trying to get people to listen to what you have to say or are you just putting it out there and you're just trying to kind of berate some other group of people because you're angry? and you're functioning more out of anger than out of reconciliation. Did you hear what I just said? So the ministry of reconciliation, he says that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them. No, no, not focusing on all the wrong that they're doing and has committed to us the word of reconciliation and then he says something, now then, and this is important, we are, what's that word? Ambassadors. Ambassadors. You know what an ambassador is? An ambassador is a representative of someone else. An ambassador of a nation, an ambassador of a person. He says, you're an ambassador for Christ. You know what your ambassador job is? You're an ambassador of reconciliation. You're an ambassador of reconciliation. So everywhere you go, in your job, in your home, in your neighborhood, with your family, when you're in conversations with people that are just like you, and you start talking about stuff, you are a re ambassador for Christ in those conversations. You're an ambassador to everyone you're around. So I wanna ask you something. Do you think you're representing Christ well in what you're saying, Amen. in what you're doing, and how you're interacting with society, what posts you post on Facebook or Instagram? Are you representing Christ to a lost world well, or are you just making your point? In the name of Jesus. Y'all all right out there? See, the Bible says about Jesus, he said when he was reviled, when he was mocked, when he was scourged, he did not revile back. This was Martin Luther King's message. He was saying, look, they're gonna attack us, they're gonna beat us, do not react. 
It says as soon as you react, you're gonna give them fuel. You're gonna give them reason to hate you. What ultimately won people over, in the, in the midst of the battle, it looked like he was losing, but, in, but, but what ultimately won people over was the fact that it was a non-resistance fight. In other words, we're not gonna fight back. We're not gonna fight back, we're just gonna make our point, we're gonna try to talk about what equality is, which is representing Christ, but we're not gonna battle back, because our battle's not with flesh and blood, our battle is with the darknesses of this world. All right, he says, you're an ambassador for Christ as though God were pleading through us, implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. All right, so the first thing is you go with the heart of reconciliation. The second thing is you gotta become intentional with reconciliation. Reconciliation does not just happen. Now here's the challenge. Because we're not used to being intentional, we're waiting on someone else to reconcile with us. Let's say you have something at odds with another person or a group of people. The Bible says if you have odds with somebody, if you're at odds with somebody, what does it say? It says go home and write a post about them on Facebook. <laughs> Vent. Talk to your friends about them. Is that what it says? It says no. It says immediately go to that person and be reconciled to them. Be intentional about working through the challenges or the difficulties. That's what we're gonna do. We go into small groups this week, you're gonna see sometimes there are gonna be some conversations where it might get a little tense where you start to discuss things. Remember, you're coming through a heart of reconciliation, but you're intentionally trying to reconcile. The goal is reconciliation. The goal is not just make your point. The goal is let's listen to each other as much as talk to each other. Amen. Years ago, when I was in a small church in Richmond, Virginia, Colleen and I had this habit of inviting people out to, to lunch after service. We were just dating, and the Lord said to us, every weekend when you go to church, find a stranger that you don't know, just go up and introduce yourself to them, talk to them for a few minutes, and invite them to lunch, take them to lunch. And we were just young, we didn't have any money, we didn't have, we didn't have anything, but we, just, we had enough, just enough, to invite people over to my apartment. I had a little small apartment in the fan of Richmond, Virginia. So one Sunday, a black woman walks into the church. She was the first that I knew of black person in our church because it was an all white church at that time, about 50 people in the church. She walks in with these three little girls, little black girls. They were all small and one of them was a baby actually. And she walks in and she comes and sits in the church and we thought, wow, our first black people. <laughs> and, 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 and the Lord said to me, he said, go invite her to your house to have lunch. So I went up to her and I invited her. I said, hi, my name's Dennis Rouse. This is my girlfriend, Colleen. Uh, and we, we, we would love to invite you and your little girls to come over to our house. And she was kind of taken back. She didn't know quite what to say about them. We're total strangers. But she, she just finally just kind of said, okay, all right. And so we just lived maybe a mile from the church. So she followed us home to the church. We made some lunch. We're sitting around the table. I had one of those wire spools that I picked up on the side of the road. This is what you do when you don't have any money. All you single folks, young folks, you know what I'm talking about. No, maybe you don't. Maybe you go out and charge it up and can't pay for it for the next 30 years. I, I just pick stuff off off the side of the road and set it in the middle of my table and put, the, put a big old plastic tablecloth over nobody even knows what's underneath that thing. You do what you gotta do, amen? amen. Stay free from debt. Anyway, we're sitting around this wire spool and uh, having our lunch, getting ready to pray, and as I'm praying... I look up at the end of the prayer and she's crying. She's got tears coming down her eyes. And I said, well, Delise, what's, what's wrong? And she said, she said, Dennis, she said, I just, you just need to understand this is the first time in my life that a white person has ever invited me to their house to eat. I've, I've worked in white people's houses. I've cleaned their houses. I've done things for them as servants, but I've never been invited into their social life. She said, this is the first time, so it's a little bit overwhelming for me. And when she said that, it, it, it suddenly brought a whole different perspective between blacks and whites to me. And I recognized that maybe it was the first time I'd ever done that. I, I think it was the first time I'd ever done that. And so we, we formed a relationship. They became dear friends of ours. The little girls, we babysat them. The middle girl was our little flower girl in our wedding. And they, they, the little girls would grow up and become a singing group called Out of Eden. Some of you may have heard of them. They're, they were a singing group in the 90s and the early 2000s, a very famous group. The mother was a worship leader. She became the worship leader of that church. When she became the worship leader of that church, 
all the black folks started coming. <laughs> Became a multicultural. You just want to, pastors, you want to know how to change your church, change a little bit of what's on the stage, and you might see some folks come in. You might, you might see some folks come in. <laughs> but the, the idea behind it was, if I'm more intentional, instead of waiting for somebody of another race to come to me, now I want you to think about it, just think about it in, in your personal life. How, when was the last time you had somebody of another race in your house and had dinner? And I know some of you white folks say, well, I, I, well you know, they're doing, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> but your black folks are just as guilty. <laughs> got your little gatherings. Hispanic folks, got your little holy huddles. <laughs> Asians over there, eating with your chopsticks, you're just doing your thing. <laughs> and we're just all segregated. We don't invite each other into each other's lives. My whole, my whole neighborhood's mixed, it's multicultural. White people started moving out of my neighborhood about 10 years ago. Some of you folks started moving in and I got right across the street, I got a Korean married to an Indian. They're, they're our neighbors next door is a white man married to a Hispanic woman. Across the way is a Hispanic man married to an Asian woman. And right around the corner are two Guatemalans. I mean, they're just all over the place. And I remember this Hispanic lady, I was walking in the neighborhood one day, and this Hispanic lady says, I'm moving, I'm getting out of the neighborhood. I said, why? She said, do you see those people that's coming into this neighborhood? I said, you're one of them. <laughs> I'm not going anywhere. I love it. I love the whole context of it because I'm finding that there's a whole other world out there outside of my white world that is so valuable and so important. And I learned so much from the Asian culture and so much from the Hispanic culture and the black culture that really blesses me that I didn't even know existed. But you have to be intentional about it. And then finally, you have to begin to adopt a kingdom culture. I'm gonna wrap it up with this and then we'll, we'll go home and we'll start talking about this this week. But there are two cultures you need to be aware of. There is your worldly culture or human culture and there is the kingdom culture. We're all born into a worldly culture or a human culture. We, all, we don't get to choose that. That's just the culture we grow up in. We eat certain foods, we listen to certain music, we talk certain ways, we have certain languages. All those things are our personal identity and then we come to Christ and we have to switch our identity from all that to now being identified with Christ. And that's a challenge for many Christians. We're not taught that very well sometimes. That we gotta switch our allegiance to our human culture over to God's culture, the kingdom culture. The worldly culture is what divides us, the kingdom culture is what unites us. All right, so when you start looking at the Bible, you see Jesus said in John chapter 18, verse 36, he says, my kingdom is not of this world. And then he would say in prayer, he said, when you pray in Matthew chapter six, verse 10, he said, pray this way, your kingdom, God's kingdom, come, your will be done on this earth as it is in heaven. What is he saying? He's saying, you know how it is in heaven? In heaven, there is no black church, white church, Hispanic church, Asian church. That's all man-made. That's all formed around worldly cultures. He said in the heavens, there's, you're gonna be surprised when you get up into heaven because the, the kind of music's up there is not gonna fit your culture. It's a kingdom culture music. And he said all the things you strive for on the earth, we pave the streets with it. We, we, in other words, life up here in heaven is different than it is in earth. He says, I want you to learn how to live on the earth with a kingdom mindset. So when you get up there, it's not strange to you. When you go into the other side, you understand what the kingdom is like and you want the kingdom to be on the earth. And so you, your job as a Christian is to try to bring the kingdom mentality to the earth, the, the heavenly mentality. And the heavenly mentality is a oneness, a reconciled a culture. Through Christ, there is no other way but through Christ, but through Christ, we become one together in the kingdom. All right, so let me give you what the 
kingdom culture looks like. This is what it looks like. First of all, you're trying to lose your life instead of save your life. Now, this is important, especially for you young folks. A lot of young folks walk around, I'm just trying to find myself. Spend your whole 20s trying to find yourself. Now you're 30, 35, and you still haven't found yourself. <laughs> haven't figured out what you wanna do with your life yet. It's because you won't find yourself. The more you try to find yourself, the more you're gonna lose yourself. You gotta lose yourself in order to find yourself. So instead of trying to protect yourself, you're now living your life to give yourself away. Secondly, you're living to serve others rather than be served. You wanna reconcile with people, serve them. You serve a person. I, I like to make, Colleen and I make a habit, whenever we see people of other cultures, if they're coming through a door or something, we hold the door for them. If they're waiting on us at a table, we make sure we give them an extra tip just to let them know Jesus loves them and we value them. I value you. I'm gonna serve you. I wanna help you. Your goals shift from how much can I acquire, build my life, to how much can I use to help other people's lives? How can I use the resources that God blesses me with to help other people? This is why I care about health care for the poor. This is why I don't just say, well, I hope you make it. Because we're getting ready to do away with everything and you're just gonna have to figure this out on your own. No. I care about your plight. I care if you don't have good health care, and maybe it's because of where you are, what economic system you're in or living in. I care about helping you get health care because when I get sick, I want to have good health care. And the Bible says, do unto others as you want to have others do unto you. I don't want other people to throw me away because I didn't make enough money to buy my health care. So I'm trying to figure out, I'm trying to figure out how can I help others. So when the government says, well, you're on your own. We build healthcare places around here to help people that can't afford healthcare. By the way, if you can't afford healthcare, you need to be going to our healthcare center. Bridge Atlanta, it's right down the street here. You pay $50 and you get the best healthcare in the world. Some of the top doctors in the city are, going to, are there to help you better than any doctor you're gonna to go to. I'm telling you, it's the best you can get. I, I, I go there, I would go there. My, I send people there that have healthcare because they get better doctor care over there. All right, your goal shift. So fourth thing, you give up your right to be offended. Oh. <laughs> Some of you are offended right now <laughs> at something. You're offended at our president. I understand. You're offended at people of another race. You're offended at the rich. You're offended at the poor. You're offended at Black Lives Matter. You're offended at Blue Lives Matter. You're offended at all kinds of things. And when you get saved, you gotta understand part of the role of your new life in Christ, you give up the right to be offended. Even though you have the right, you give it up. Because you're an ambassador. You're an ambassador of reconciliation. So when you get offended, you rein it in, I, I get offended from, how many of you get offended from time to time? You rein it in, you, you, you submit it to the Lord, you don't type on Facebook when you're offended or comment. Some of you get on Facebook and you get on that comment thing and you get on, and you start arguing with people over racial issues, thinking that somehow that's gonna solve everything. All right, this is the sign of maturity. The sign of maturity in the body of Christ is you give up the right to be offended. And then the fifth thing is you value people as much as you value yourself. You value everyone. You value all the people. You value immigrants. You value, listen to me, illegal immigrants. They're valuable to God. They may not be valuable to people in America, but they're valuable to God. You know how immigration from Mexico started? It's when we took all the Japanese and put them in these camps. There was no labor in, Mex in, in California, so we had to immigrate the Mexicans to do the labor that the Japanese were doing because no whites wanted to do that work. So we brought them over from Mexico, now we're complaining and we wanna send them back and build a wall. All right, now my point is, I'm, listen, I'm not, I'm, I'm not advocating illegal 
immigration. I'm not advocating we should do that. But once you get to know somebody who's come over here, you begin to study their life, you begin to get into their life, it's a little different than just send them all back. Listen to me, listen to me. I want you to listen to this carefully. I'm not advocating illegal immigration, but what I'm saying is this. There's a difference between people who come over and cause harm and people who are actually good people for the country. There's a difference. And you can't lump everybody into one group. Listen, you understand this. If you have a child that's, that, that you raise and, and all of a sudden your child announces to you that they're gay, that they decided to live a gay lifestyle. Well, you're against, let's say you're against the gay lifestyle because you believe biblically that doesn't, that's not supporting, uh, God does not support a gay lifestyle, which we, we, we believe that in the Bible. But it's, at the same time, they're still a human being, they're still a person, they're still valuable to God. Just like any other sinner in the world that's out there committing heterosexual sins, which all of you in this room probably have done. And aren't you glad, get, glad God didn't just excommunicate you when you did something out of sorts with God? So suddenly it's your family, it's your daughter, your son. Your viewpoint now begins to shift, not that you're agreeing with the lifestyle, but you shift how you care about that person. It's the same way with immigrants. Once you get to know them, see, well, a lot of people sit back in their, wheel, in their, in their not their wheelchair, but their armchair, <laughs> maybe their wheelchair, but their armchair, and they just watch it, watch Fox News, and they, ah, get them all back, and they form these opinions without getting to know people. Once you get to know people, you see how valuable they are and loving people they are, and they just, once 9-11 happened, it made it almost impossible to get in this country and you started seeing where they're coming from, especially if they're coming from really persecuted nations like Sudan and some of these countries where they, where they would lose their lives as a Christian in those nations. You begin to understand there's a little bit more to it than just build a wall and send them back. Did you follow me? Now I'm saying this because some of us, we kind of form these opinions and we don't value people as God values them. God values the whole world. He doesn't just value, value Europeans or Americans. Or, 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 you know, Africans. He values the whole world. And then, finally, the kingdom culture is this. You love your enemies. <laughs> Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who use you and persecute you. You love your enemies. This is what separates you out. This is what makes you an ambassador for Jesus Christ and reconciliation. Now, what would it look like if all of us watching around the world, watching online at our other campus, at Hamilton Mill and at Midtown here in Norcross, what would it look like if we all just started adopting the kingdom culture? Be more intentional in what we do, putting aside some of our prejudices and starting to reconcile with each other. All right, I wanna pray for you. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And I want you to take a moment of self-examination and ask yourself this question. Is there any prejudice in my heart? Is there anything in my heart that I'm living with that's offended at other races? It's possible that one of the reasons that you're having a hard time is there's not a fully surrendered heart to Jesus yet. A sign of maturity in Christ is when you start to love people that don't love you back, overcome the offenses that they levy at you because you have a new heart, a new created heart. The only way for you to really reconcile is you have to be born again. When Jesus comes and tells us this, he says, I came to give you a new life, a whole new perspective on life, a whole new outlook on life that's not gonna line up with the way the world views things. It's gonna line up with the way God views things. And I'm coming here to save you so that you can then be an ambassador for me to a lost and hurting world. If you're here today or you're watching us at the other campuses or you're somewhere in the world in a small group watching us somewhere around the world and you don't know Jesus, I'm gonna lead us in a prayer. And if you wanna pray with me, you join me in this prayer. And if you're a believer, you can also pray this prayer of just committing yourself to Jesus. Let's say this together. Jesus, right now, I present myself to you my whole life. And I repent of my sins, especially the sin of prejudice. 
I ask you to deal with my heart right now and begin to forgive me of everything in my life that goes against your will. I believe in you, Jesus. I believe you died on a cross for my sins, and I believe you rose from the dead. Today, I surrender my life to you, and I ask you, Jesus Christ, come into this heart, cleanse me of my past, and give me a new life from this day forward. In Jesus' name. Let's lift our hands to him. Lord, we, we submit ourselves to you. We welcome you, Holy Spirit, to come and do that cleansing work in our hearts, cleansing us from all evil, all prejudice, all bitterness, all anger, all things that defile us right now and give us a clean heart right now. And Lord, I pray for a fresh anointing to come down on your church, not just here, but across this nation where you start to break down the walls of segregation in our hearts, begin to break down all the racial tensions in our lives and help us to become ambassadors of reconciliation to a lost and dying world. We invite that anointing upon this church and upon this people that are watching this video. We invite you to come now and anoint us with the Holy Spirit to do this work of reconciliation in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen and amen. Come on, let's give him praise.